Thank you very much, Pair. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Head of the Department, ladies and gentlemen, it's a very great pleasure indeed to be with you. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. Very great pleasure to be here today to uh, welcome you all to this 18th International Conference on Engineering Design on behalf of the Design Society. Um, as we were coming up this morning, I was reminded of Alex Duffy's immortal words six years ago in Melbourne. To paraphrase him, it's great to be here in Copenhagen. Your summers are just like ours. And uh, my, my task today is to talk to you about this, the diversity of this thing which is design and this thing which is design research. Uh, and in doing so, to do two things. First of all, to tell you a little bit about the society and the society's activities. Uh, but also to share with you some personal reflections which I've been developing over the few last few months about the nature of design research and about the diversity. Um, and I'd like to start, let me just see, uh, I think I should probably go on to my, well my, excuse me, I think I need to exit and load my slides, apologies for this. Yes, I'd like to start with the words of one of my heroes, Herb Simon, who uh, just over 40 years ago gave a series of lectures uh, on the art sciences of the artificial and then wrote a book on those lectures. And I think what Herb Simon said at that time can be a mantra for us in the design community. He said that engineering, medicine, business, architecture, and painting, and I'm sure we can think of others, are concerned not with the necessary, but with the contingent not with how things are, but how they might be, in short, with design. And uh, uh, the, the statement which I think sums it all up, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And I think we, we see the truth of what uh, Simon says all around us. We live in an artificial world. Our exteriors are artificial. Our interiors are artificial. Even when we see the natural world, we see everywhere the hand of man and the hand of design in effect. The, the, the crop, the arrangement of the field are as artificial as the machine that's harvesting them. Design today gives us unprecedented opportunities for movement, travel, and communication. Design is with us at our birth. Design is with us through life. Design is with us in our work and in our play. Design gives us elegance and comfort in our lives. And design can be a great source of pleasure in our lives as well. Now, as well as this enormous diversity in the artifacts in the focus of design, there is an enormous diversity in the way that design is studied. Design research might be focused on the designer, on the design team, on the artifact in various ways, on the process in which the artifact is designed, on the management of that process and of the organizations and people that carry out the activity. It may be focused on the nature of creativity and of the cognitive processes which lead to it. It may be focused on the nature of innovation in different contexts and communities, on the customer's response to the artifact, on the, on the cultural issues that apply within the teams, within the users of the artifact, emotional responses to the artifact and so on. The list is endless. I'm sure you can think of many things which are not in that list. And the third aspect of the diversity is in the nature of the communities that study design, partly because of the different artifact focus and also partly because of the different subject areas of interest. Um, we see design studied by applied artists, by researchers in management, by computer scientists and urban planners, production engineers, engineering scientists, and we can imagine design being studied by um, in effect, what are design activities studied by medics, uh, studied by 
uh, those involved in agriculture and so on from what we've seen. Now, Paul and Bites in their great book on engineering design place engineering design at, a, at an interface between two spectra running from politics through to art and science through to production. And we can place, we, they place engineering design, and I think in this community we would like to place engineering design at that interface. But, but the other communities, applied art is at this place in the cross. Management research perhaps in this location at the interface to economics and design. Production engineers and the interface to design here and engineering scientists there. As I say, the, this, this community, this uh, conference is centered at the center of that cross, but also extends, I think, in all four directions from it. And as an illustration of the diversity of the community, we um, took the key terms that have been used in the 4,000 odd papers on the Design Society's website. And um, the, the, the computer team at Zagreb uh, produced those terms and we, we then went through and uh, dealt with differences in spelling, English and American spelling. We stemmed, uh, took the stems of words, we looked for acronyms and so on. Even when we combined all those, there were some six and a half thousand terms have been used by this community in 4,000 papers. And only five terms used more than 100 times. Only 188 used more than 10 times. And nearly 5,000 only used once. And that's a problem for us, I think, uh, as well as a, a strength of the diversity. The, we know that design has enormous potential. Oh, oh, excuse me, uh, I, I, I've got ahead of myself. The, 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 these are the, hundred and, uh, these are the, uh, fifth, the key terms that were used at least 50 times. Interestingly, the one which appeared uh, most times for design structure matrix, perhaps reflecting the special, the, uh, the particular conference in that area. Design education, product development, design process, computer-aided design uh, occurring very significant numbers of times. But I think those terms show the, the, the breadth of interest and the major areas of interest within our community. Now we know that we see every day terms like this expressing the potential of design. How can we communicate that potential to the uh, rest of the world? Because we have an issue, we heard earlier from the president, that the rest of the world may only have narrow understanding of design. For some people in the general public, design may be about designer clothes or the design of a particular piece of furniture. For those in public bodies, design may be simply about styling or, as we've heard, about cultural issues and may not reflect the, the diversity. The Design Society is working to, to address that. As you've heard from Tim McAloon, uh, the, our society has, for this conference and for the previous one, had a set of um, themes which have been used for organizing the papers and also organizing the publications into a number of proceedings. And that, that list is also used with additions by the design uh, conference in Croatia. In addition to the themes, the society has a number of special interest groups and those special interest groups are transient bodies within the society uh, that, that look at particular areas of interest and develop our understanding in detail. Uh, there are special interest groups associated with a number of the themes in design processes, design theory, human behavior in design, design education. And there are also special interest groups in creativity, eco-design, mechatronics, structural complexity, decision making, computational design synthesis, risk management and emotion and design. Some of those, all of those, or nearly all of those, have workshops here at this conference. And I hope that many of you will be able to attend those workshops and join with us in developing our understanding in those areas. A number of those have their own conferences, Engin engineering and product design education, for example, the International Conference on Design Creativity, 
modeling and management of engineering processes. And those are other opportunities that you have to develop our understanding in detail. Um, and we are looking all the time for new SIGs. Those last two, risk management and design and emotion, are only just started with the society. If any of you have proposals for other SIGs, please uh, feel free to approach us on the Design Society stand, make yourself known to the uh, Board of Management or the Advisory Board. But uh, as I said at the beginning, I've also been, been trying to think how do we, uh, do we characterize these thing, this thing called design. And some of you will know that I'm, uh, in my research work, interested in a thing called faceted classification. In faceted classification, we don't classify things into a, a hierarchical taxonomy, but as instead associate with an object being classified a number of facets, a number of attributes of the object. And I've wondered whether this would help in categorizing the research that we do. And I've looked at, at uh, the work that we've published in the society recently, in particular in ICED 09, which I'll come to uh, shortly, using these facets. And uh, for example, I observed that, that some research that's done is looking perhaps in real time at the behavior of, of uh, uh, designers. So it's looking at studying design as it happens over minutes or hours, perhaps. Some research may be looking at how organizations develop over months or years. Some research is aimed at the early phases of the product life cycle, others at the middle or later phases. Some is aimed at studying individuals, others at teams, others at whole communities. Some is focused on a single activity or issue, other on perhaps how many activities can be integrated. At the artifact focus, it may, the focus may be on a single part or feature of a part, or the focus may be on uh, assemblies or complex interactive systems, interconnected systems. Design may be studying people working at uh, different levels of originality or tools may support work at different levels of originality from variant uh, through to work trying to achieve radical innovation. Researchers may use different levels of abstraction in uh, representing uh, the work done or designers may use different levels of abstraction in their tools. And finally, the research approach differs widely from experimental and observational techniques, survey and questionnaire, modeling and simulation, literature survey, case study, and experimental application of methods and tools. As an example of this, I'm going to show you four examples from papers. These are anonymized, really. Some of you may recognize your work. I hope I haven't offended you in doing so. But for example, from the human behavior and design theme, one might see a paper like this, comparison between the responses of experienced and inexperienced designers to visual stimuli and idea generation. That would be work looking at behavior of individuals in real time, operating over a period of minutes, working on a single activity. In the paper I saw, it was looking at single and small assemblies, uh, working at the early concept stages of the life cycle in an original design context, and the method used was observation, I think, and protocol analysis as well. By contrast, in the Design for X theme, we might see a paper like Design of Forgings for Fatigue Resistance. This would be work aimed at supporting design at the embodiment and detail phases, helping designers design single parts and features of parts, a single or small number of activities, medium level of abstraction used in the tools. The tool might ap be applied by individuals over a period of a few minutes or hours, typically in an adaptive design context, not exclusively. And the method used in that sort of work was literature review and then embedding of the results in a tool which is then experimentally applied. A third example, this case from the processes, design processes area of the spectrum, studying automobile supplier uh, in process simulation, looking at activities that take place over weeks and months by many people in interconnected teams, 
working on sub-assemblies, uh, high level of abstraction in the, in the modeling approach, and the whole series of life cycle stages from specification through to detail, and the research technique there used modeling and simulation. And finally, a paper that might typify that in the organization and management theme, management of design responses to environmental legislative change in the consumer electronics industry, looking at the response to the WE or the ROSE initiative, for example. There it's about development in a company over, of companies over a period of months on a range of activities by groups of people, again working on small assemblies, low levels of abstraction, a range of life cycle phases, typically in adaptive design, and there the method is interview and questionnaire of those involved in the companies. Now what I did, I, I took the 340 papers presented at I said 09, excluding the design education papers because they were not necessarily research papers. And I, I categorized each of them uh, in that sort of pattern. Some are easier to categorize than others. And then what I'd like to do is present you some of the results of that just to show the sort of patterns that we see. This next slide's rather busy, but bear with me on it. It's the shapes and patterns I want you to see, not the absolute numbers. I think this is, yes, I've still got it on the chest. Um, the, these are the eight categories. Human behavior and design papers. We're looking at a whole range of timescales, but we're dominated by studying uh, individuals or small groups working over short periods of time and working on a small number of issues typically working on parts and small assemblies. At low levels of abstraction, adaptive and original design, and work concentrated in the early life cycle stages, uh, early stages of the design process, concept and early concept. I've distinguished, tried to distinguish between the early concept and concept phases. And there, there were very clear pattern in the research methodology that in that theme, extensively observation and survey were used, to some extent literature survey and so on, but the, the research was dominated there. Let's look at another theme and just watch the transition here. Quite a different pattern. This is the design processes theme and here the work is studying much longer periods. This is days through to weeks in my uh, parlance. Greater number of issues, now looking at teams of various sizes, working on assemblies mainly, high levels of abstraction in the modeling, adaptive and original design, now extending more into the embodiment detail phases of the process, but completely different research methodology. Now by modeling, experimental met application of a method, experimental application of tool supported by survey. Let's look at one more in a bit of detail and that's design organization and management. And again, look at the transition. Much longer time scales, looking at how people and organizations work and develop over months. Greater number of issues, greater number of people. This is now sort of interconnected teams of people. This, I was characterizing this as assembly of a complexity of a car, say. And now we're starting to see more interest in trying to achieve radical innovation and we're starting again to see more emphasis still on the later stages right through life of the life cycle. But here again, the research methodology is different, dominated by literature and by modeling and by survey and case study here. I'll show you three more, but only just picking out some points in them because I'm conscious of time. This is design information and knowledge and Design information knowledge is about preserving, developing knowledge over a long period, and we see that in the papers. And also, we see that this is the area where there is the most emphasis on embodiment, on fleshing out the, the design. And here, our methodology is dominated by modeling, but also experimental application of a method. And here, there are lots of experimental tools, lots of computer tools to help support information and knowledge. Design theory and research methodology, we're back now to small groups of people, small numbers of issues, working in the early stages of the process. And in this area, there was lots of literature study, people saying, pulling together 
literature to form a theoretical framework, say. And there was lots of work again on experimental application of a method. Design methods and tools. Again, small numbers of issues, small numbers of people. And here, this, was a, this is a very big group, enormous amount of work saying, here is my method, here is how it works. Design for X, design 2X, as one imagine, dominated by single issue papers, where the X is some single issue. And here we start having more emphasis on nowhere, we had a lot of emphasis on through life. This is in particular the eco papers. And again, modeling and experimental method is the methodology. Product and systems design, uh, a lot of these are smeared, but modeling, experimental method, now quite a lot of case studies, and now quite a lot of through life work in the systems area. Finally, the overall pattern. Now, we don't learn much from the overall pattern because the figures are all smeared across there. But what we do learn there, I think, is from the gaps. And what we see as a community, I saw in two, two years ago, very little on the systems area. And this is service. For some reason or other, thank you, Mr. Gates, I couldn't mark that. Everything else I could label, I couldn't mark that. But that was service or product service system. Although we say it's important, there wasn't much evidence of it two years ago. There's not much evidence of studying communities. And we're dominated by early concepts and concept. We don't do much in the detail area. And supporting what my colleague uh, Steve Cully has said for some time, we don't do much support of development. And our research methodologies, these are the experimental methodologies. We don't apply them anywhere near as widely as we might, I think. Now that's partly because these are conference papers and you would add more experimental development, but we're dominated by modeling and this is my method, here's how it works. Now, as I said before, those were my uh, facets and you might consider others. It might be positivism versus uh, uh, other uh, approaches to research. It might be technology readiness levels. It might be the research domain we look at and things like that. I'd be very interested to hear what you think of it. It's my interpretation uh, and all, I would apply my bias on that. So I'm not saying this is a perfect allocation. But what I do think is that by characterizing our work better, we can cluster work very much better. I saw as I went through that I'd have the same pattern in a series of papers, and that showed the program team assigned them together very well. But it also helps us identify outliers. Uh, I very often see a paper that didn't fit in with the pattern, and in reading it in more detail, yes, it, I think it was badly placed. Um, but equally, it could identify where people are taking new lines in a particular area. But two more important things perhaps may help external observers, industry contacts, for example, find work of interest. A company might say, I want a technique that I can apply to help a small team working on assembly design in a, an adaptive design situation. And they could pick out in that way. And as I've shown, it helps us map where there are gaps in our work, where our understanding is good, and where it's poor. But more generally, I think this mapping should be part of a larger work within the community, is part of a larger work within the community on how we characterize this thing called design, design research, and where it should go in the future. Uh, identifying where we agree, consolidating terminology and identifying gaps. And here I return to those key words. We need to look at those five or 6,000. We need to consolidate them and, and uh, say, what are the real key issues and how are they developing with time? How are the, the terms, which are the terms which are on the increase and so on. Now that's being done by the Design Society again. The, the society has a board of management and also a, an advisory board of 28 that advises the society and we heard there are SIG leaders as well. And every March we meet at what we call the Riggy meeting. This is, uh, this is the advisory board and the board of management meeting this March in, in Rome. And this year, the focus of our scientific discussion in that meeting was on saying, 
What's the future of design research? What are the key topics? How are they developing? And so on. This is still work in progress. The AB is going to be discussing it this week. But the, that meeting was reported, has been reported on by Warren Searing and, and uh, Joseph Oman from MIT. And I'll just pick out a snippet from, from the report. They, they've characterized design research as, as being about three preferable future states. Number one is that design should be about effective design. A preferable future state from design research should be effective design. That product development teams will deliver successful products consistently and with shorter development timescales. Secondly, that design research should lead to de sustainable design. The stream of new products and processes for delivering them should be sustainable. And thirdly, that design research should lead to documented design. That design and product development should be studied using a set of accepted research methods. Best product development practices will be understood and used pervasively. And I would add to that that the product itself will be well documented and the process of designing it will be well documented. And what that report does is take a variety of design research activities that came from the discussions of the AB and maps them against those three preferable future states. Now, you can all help in this. We, we want the whole community to feed into us. You can obviously please give us your suggestions for categorization. Tell us whether what I've presented is of interest and, and is, could be used in the future. Please, you can help us consolidate uh, terms and map our research. If you're interested in joining in a team in that consolidation, uh, please leave your name. I'll explain in a moment. We would like to identify what are the future challenges for research in our community. And in particular, what would really characterize a breakthrough in our research? And when we've done that, we then wish to try to communicate that to people who we should be influencing public bodies, refer research funders, government, our academic colleagues, and so on. So if you have any contribution on any of that, please come and visit us at the Design Society stand. Leave a comment. There's a comment book there that you can leave. Talk to us. The, uh, advise the Board of Management will be at the uh, stand, members of the Board of Management, uh, much of the week. And Anna Clark will be there to take your comments also or email me your ideas at president at designsociety.org. I'm sure I've run out of time, not quite, I think we're still there. Um, let's draw to conclusion. Thank you once again uh, to the organizers for this invitation to uh, speak to you. And thank you on behalf of the society and uh, all of those here, to those who have made the conference possible to Tim Matheloon, Tom Howard, and all of the team at DTU uh, for the fantastic work you've done, to Steve Cully, Ben Hicks, and all of the program team for, for creating a great program for us, to all those behind the scenes uh, who are feeding us and watering us during the week and, and uh, catering for all our whims, the reviewers who have reviewed the papers, the session chairs who will chair the session in the coming few days, all the authors who contributed papers, and all of you for attending. Design Society wishes you all a great conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.